وقل رب زدني علما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد تريدا إن شاء الله تعالى we begin our new course our new studies and that is in fiqh and in particular we will be going through the famous book Bulugh al-Maram and that is the book that is authored by Al-Hafiz Ibn Hajar Al-Asqalani Rahimahullahu Ta'ala Before beginning the actual book <coughs> we'll begin with an introduction regarding studying hadith and studying fiqh and a brief background regarding that from what a shaykh al-fawzan hafizahullah ta'ala has mentioned he says لما كانت السنة النبوية هي المصدر الثاني للشريعة بعد كتاب الله القرآن اعتنى علماء الإسلام بسنة الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم بعد عنايتهم بالقرآن الكريم فأقبلوا عليها حفظا ورواية ودراية He mentions that because the sunnah it is the second source of knowledge the second source of this sharia after the book of allah the quran then the scholars they paid a lot of attention to it and they gave a lot of importance to it because it is the second source for this Sharia, the Quran and the Sunnah. <coughs> and so the scholars, they gave importance to the Sunnah in learning it, in understanding it, in recognizing the chains of narration and analyzing them, understanding the meanings of Hadith, they gave a lot of importance to understanding this sunnah and memorizing it and practicing it, of course. وَأَلَّفُوا فِيهَا مُؤَلَّفَاتِ مُتَنَوَّعَةِ And they wrote many different books. أَلَّفُوا فِيهَا الْمُؤَلَّفَاتِ الْمُتَنَوَّعَةِ they wrote many different books regarding the Sunnah. وَوَضَعُوا عَلَيْهَا الشُّرُوحَ الْكَثِيرَةِ And they also put down many explanations. Books were written by the scholars. Explanations were written upon those books in order to make the Sunnah clear and understandable to the people. كل ذلك يدل على أن السنة أمرها مهم في الإسلام. All of this indicates that the affair of the Sunnah is something great in Islam. The fact that the scholars gave it so much importance, that they studied it, the chains of narration of hadith, the meanings of those hadith, the fact that the scholars gave so much importance to all this, then it means that it has a great status and it is something very important for us to understand and learn. لِأَنَّ السُنَّةَ النَّبَوِيَّةَ تُوَضِّحُ الْقُرْآنَ وَتُفَسِّرُهُ وَتُدُلُّ عَلَيْهِ 
because the prophetic sunnah, it clarifies the Qur'an. It clarifies the Qur'an and it explains what may be general in the Qur'an. And so it is of great importance. Allah mentioned in the Qur'an, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ That we reveal to you a dhikr, the sunnah, so that you may clarify to the people what was revealed upon them, i.e. the Qur'an. So the Prophet ﷺ conveyed that message to us, that sunnah to us, the sunnah that was preserved by the companions thereafter and the tabi'een and the great scholars throughout history. The sheikh also mentions <coughs> that the scholars, they wrote many different types of books about the sunnah. Some of them were long, detailed books, and some of them were shorter, more brief books, all in different methods and different ways. Many of them, or one of the types of them, are the ones that are organized on the chapters of fiqh. This book now, Bulugh al-Maram, is one of those books that was written about fiqh, but upon the chapters or the relevant chapters for each section. So you have the chapter of purification, and then you have, or the book of purification, then you have the book of prayer, and the book of fasting, and the book of zakat, and the book of hajj, all of these different sections and under each section they will then put the relevant hadith from the sunnah into it the relevant narrations from the sunnah would then be placed accordingly under each chapter so that is how this book is organized this book bulugh al-maram of Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala is upon the chapters of fiqh it is a book of hadith it is a book of hadith but organized on the chapters of fiqh so that is what we'll see as we go through as Shaykh Al-Fawzan says هَذَا هُوَ أَحَدُ هَذِهِ الْكُتُبِ الْمُخْتَصَرَ الْجَامِعَ الْمُفِيدَةِ that this book, Bulugh al-Maram, is one of the summarized books, but comprehensive. It covers all of the chapters, covers all of the various topics, but it is summarized. It's not the most detailed. There are others even more detailed, but it does cover all of the topics and all of the chapters. وَيُمْكِنْ حِفْظُهُ بِسُهُولًا the Sheikh says it is easy to memorize. Easy to memorize for the one who tries and strives. فَيَكُونُ ثَرْوَةً عِنْدَ طَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ يَجْمَعُ لَهُ الْأَدِلَّةِ عَلَى كُلِّ مَسْأَلَةِ وَعَلَى كُلِّ بَابِ بِحَيْثِ إِذَا طُلِبَ مِنْهُ الدَّلِيلِ فَإِذَا هُوَ يَحْفَظُهُ حَاضِرًا عِنْدَهُ So if you were to memorize this book, if you were to memorize Bulugh al-Maram as we go along, <clears throat> then that would be a resource that you have, that any time somebody asks you, then you have this resource memorized. Any time something comes up about purification, you have these hadith memorized. Any time something comes up about prayer, you'll have the hadith memorized. So it is a very good book to try and memorize as you go along. Memorize the one or two or three hadith per week. And you'll find inshallah ta'ala as time goes by, 
that you are memorizing it, large sections of it, many a hadith of it. So that is this basic book, Bulugh al-Maram, which is a summary of fiqh. It goes through the different chapters of fiqh. And the first chapter that we're going to begin with here at the beginning of the book is the book of purification, the chapter of the waters. The book of purification. Why do the scholars in these types of books begin with the section about purification first? Why not begin with the prayer, the second highest pillar of Islam? Why not begin with the prayer first? Why begin with purification? Why not begin with hajj first? Or fasting, or zakat, big topics and pillars of Islam. Why begin with purification and about the different types of water? Why would that be the opening section to Bulugh al-Maram? And in fact, many of the books of hadith that are organized upon the chapters of fiqh, they begin with the chapter or the book of purification first. But why? Who can tell us why? Anyone? Worship does not work without being pure. You can fast without purity. You can do lots of acts of worship without purity. So you need to be a bit more specific with your answer. You're on the right lines. Why do the scholars begin with Purification as the first chapter, because we've mentioned before that prayer, prayer and some other acts of worship require as a prerequisite that you be upon purification. Prayer, the second highest pillar of Islam, required obligatory five times a day but a prerequisite of prayer is that you have to be upon purification therefore it makes sense that the chapter of purification should come first and then it be followed up by the chapter or the book about prayer and that is exactly what happens here The section about purification comes first. Then after that, the section about prayer. Because you need the purification to be able to pray. So it wouldn't make sense to teach you all about the prayer first if you haven't even been taught about purification. Because your prayer would not be acceptable without purification. (coughs) Hence the scholars... They often begin their books with the section on purification first. <clears throat> so he says here, Kitab tahara the book of purification. The word kitab in the Arabic language basically means a compilation. A compilation of things. So you have several chapters, for example, the compiled end result of all of those chapters together is that you have a book. So a book is a gathering and a compilation of several things put together. In this case, several different chapters as we're going to come and see. Chapter about water, chapter about the dishes, chapter about this and that. Various chapters, all of which come under the topic of purification. 
Hence the book of purification because it compiles and combines all of those different chapters together. And that's the meaning of the word kitab in the Arabic language. Somewhere, something that has a gathering and a compilation of things within it. As for at-tahara, what does the word at-tahara mean? At-tahara, purification as we say, linguistically, هِيَ النَّظَافَةَ وَالنَّزَاهَةَ عَنِ الْأَقْذَارِ الْحِسِّيَّةِ وَالْمَعْنَوِيَّةِ It is to cleanse yourself, purification, to cleanse yourself and purify yourself from any, anything which is of impurity, anything which is of an impure nature that you clean yourself from that whether you do that physically physically purifying yourself or it can be metaphorically or as we say the internal purification the internal purification is purifying your heart from shirk, purifying your heart from disobedience against Allah and being pure upon Tawheed. That is an internal purification you are carrying out. The external physical purification is of course the washing and the cleaning. So linguistically it is cleaning, cleansing oneself from that dirt and from that impurity whether physically or something which is internal like the purification of oneself from kufr and disbelief also internal purification could be in relation to your manners that you purify your behavior and you purify your manners and your morals and your etiquettes. That is all a form of internal purification. So linguistically it means to clean yourself, to cleanse yourself internally maybe or physically externally. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran regarding the household of Lut, إِنَّهُمْ أُنَاسٌ يَتَطَهَّرُونَ Indeed, they are a people who purify. They purify themselves. يَعْنِي يَتَطَهَّرُونَ مِنَ الْأَخْلَاقِ الرَّذِيلَةِ That they purify themselves from the lowly and degrading manners purify themselves from that poor behavior. As for the meaning of purification Islamically, what does purification mean Islamically? In the shari'i, legislative meaning of the word, فَهِيَ رَفْعُ الْحَدَثِ وَمَا فِي مَعْنَاهُ وَزَوَالُ الْخَبَثِ وَالْحَدَثِ معنى يقوم بالبدن هو شيء غير محسوس يمنع من صحة الصلاة والطواف ومس المصحف إلى غير ذلك فيقال للمحدث حدثا أصغر أو أكبر يقال له غير طاهر يعني لا تصح منه الصلاة ولا يجوز له مس المصحف ولا يصح منه الطواف والحائض لا يصح منها الصيام إلى غير ذلك Purification Islamically, then it means Raf'ul Hadath, to remove something from yourself that is preventing you from worshipping. To remove some 
impurity, but not physically. Some other type of impurity, like for example, if a person breaks wind, now you are upon a state where you require purification, you require wudu, but there's no physical dirt you're washing off anywhere. But in meaning, you now need to purify yourself. The other type is where there is physical Physical impurity that you need to remove. For example, you have some urine or something else that comes upon your body or your clothes. Then that physically needs to be removed. So purification Islamically is to remove that which prevents you from performing worship. Prevents you from performing worship like if you've broken wind. Then you need to purify yourself or physically removing and getting rid of any impurity that may be upon you. So Islamically, it is the removal of that impurity, whether it is something physical or non-physical. Then after that, Kitab al-Tahara, the book of purification, we have Kitab al-Miyah. The chapter regarding the waters. Why is this chapter mentioned in the plural form? The chapter of waters. Why not the chapter of water? It says the chapter of waters. Why would it be in the plural when we don't use water in the plural? Anyone? It is. It is referring to the different types of water and the different rulings that different types of water have. Because when you want to make wudu and you want to make wusal, you want to make that purification, then what do you need? Water. But it's not just any water you can use. You have to understand which water is okay to use for purification and which water you're not allowed to use for purification. That's why al hafiz ibn Hajar begins with this chapter to highlight to you when it comes to purification you have to be aware what water you can use and what water you're not allowed to use so in this opening hadith then hadith number one in bulugh al-maram now that we've briefly looked at the chapter headings the book of purification the chapter of waters. Now we'll have a look at the opening hadith in this particular section. And that is the hadith where it is mentioned. An Abi Hurairata radiallahu anhu qal qal rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fil bahar هو الطهور ماؤه الحل ميتته أخرجه الأربعة وابن أبي شيبة ولفظ له وصححه ابن خزيمة والترمذي ورواه مالك وشافعي وأحمد In this opening hadith the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said about sea water ocean water so that is one type of water the sea water the ocean water the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said about ocean water or sea water it is pure purifying it is pure and purifying its water and its dead 
the animals that die from the sea animals are permissible to eat even without slaughtering. So we'll come to the details of this narration. Now, firstly the hadith is narrated by Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, one of the famous companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, narrated more hadith than any other companion. And Abu Huraira was obviously his kunya. As for his actual name, then the scholars, they differed over what Abu Huraira's actual name was. And there are in fact around 30 opinions of the scholars as to what his actual name was. The most authentic and strongest opinion is that his actual name was Abdul Rahman. Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhar al Dosi. Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhar al Dosi. That is the strongest suggestion as to what his actual name was, the name of Abu Huraira. لازم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ليسمع منه الحديث ويرويه عن. It's known about Abu Huraira that he <coughs> that he stuck with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم a lot in order that he could learn those narrations from him. And then narrate those narrations. وَقَدْ دَعَا لَهُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم made dua for Abu Huraira ولذلك صار أكثر الصحابة حديثا رواية للحديث And that's why he became the most prolific narrator of hadith from all of the companions. لأنه فرغ نفسه لرواية الحديث عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم because he freed himself up completely to listen to hadith to learn them to narrate them he spent his time with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم learning those narrations memorizing those narrations and then conveying those narrations فَلَمْ يَشْتَغِلْ بِالْتِجَارَةِ So Abu Huraira was not somebody who spent any time in business, trade. He never used to do that. وَلَمْ يَشْتَغِلْ بِأَيِّ شَيْءٍ He never used to preoccupy himself with anything else. وَاقْتَصَرَ عَلَى مَا يَقْتَاتُ بِهِ مِنَ الطَّعَامِ And he used to just basically eat that minimum amount that he needed to get by on. Abu Huraira never used to involve himself in business or trade or anything like that. He used to eat that minimum amount he could get by on. وَصَبَرَ عَلَى مَا يَنَالُهُ مِنَ الْجُوعِ فِي سَبِيلِ رِوَايَةِ الْحَدِيثِ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ And it's mentioned about him that... He would remain patient upon the hunger, extreme hunger, that he would often experience. He would remain patient upon that in order to make sure he could spend the maximum time possible on knowledge, on hadith, on learning from the Prophet ﷺ, such that he never had time to go and be in business or trade, and so he used to just live off that minimum what he could get by on, eating that minimum he could get by on, and so he would experience hunger often, but he would be patient upon that, upon the path of knowledge and narrating hadith. وَلِذَلِكَ صَارَ أَكْثَرُ الصَّحَابَةِ رِوَايَةً And that's why he was the most prolific narrator from the companions, he narrated more hadith than any other companion. حَتَّى إِنَّهُ رَوَى 
عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خمسة آلاف ثلاثمائة وسبعة وأربعين حديثا أو نحو من ذلك He narrated in the region of 5,347 hadith. In the region of 5,347 hadith. Over 5,000 narrations that he learned from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and narrated. وَلَمْ يَلْحَقْهُ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الصَّحَابَةِ بِحِفْظِ الْحَدِيثِ رضي الله عنه None of the other companions matched up to him in his memorization of the hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم وَكَانَ يَسْهَرُ الليل لحفظ الحديث And he used to stay up at night learning and memorizing those hadith not wasting time Staying up at night, learning and memorizing the hadith. And that's why if a student found that working into the night is something he finds useful for himself, it's quiet, it's peaceful, he gets a lot of work done, then it's allowed, it is allowed to stay up at night late doing your work if you find that fruitful to do as long as you do not miss the obligations upon you the fajr prayer as long as you maintain the obligations upon you then it is permissible for a person to stay up during the night to work and to study and on one occasion a sheikh ali nasir al-faqihi hafizahullah ta'ala was asked that question, is it allowed for a student to stay up night, stay up at night learning and working? He said, okay, yes, but as long as you maintain your obligations, if it means you're going to miss the Fajr prayer, or it means you're going to miss obligations of your family and other problems, then no. But if you're in a situation, maybe single, maybe no other family or responsibilities, and you find it useful to stay up at night working, then it can be done, it can be done for those who are serious, not for the lazy who don't get up till late and then they stay up at night and they're not even productive with their work, but those who are serious. Abu Huraira was of course absolutely serious and he would stay up at night and he would learn that hadith and memorize it. حتى إن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أمره أن يوتر قبل أن ينام لأنه يسهر الليل ولا ينام إلا آخر الليل And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم told him to pray his witter before he sleeps <coughs> at the end because he used to stay awake till a very late time so the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم told him to pray his witter then before going to sleep so that is Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira then Abu Huraira then says here anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam qala fi al-bahr that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said regarding the sea the bahr in Arabic the sea or the ocean is the word bahr and bahr linguistically it means like a crack a a fissure a crack a gap that is the meaning of the word bahar linguistically and in this case then you have that crack in the earth which is filled with the water so it is loosely based upon that the crack or the opening in the earth which is then filled with the water. So the word bahar in Arabic, an opening or a crack or a split, and that's what oceans are. They are an opening or a split in the ground, and then that is filled with the water. So the Prophet ﷺ said regarding it, huwa tahuru ma'uhu, that the water of the ocean, it is pure and purifying. Why did the Prophet ﷺ mention that? 
It is because there is a story behind this hadith. There used to be some sailors at that time. Sailors who used to go out on their boats, out on their ships. They would go out on the ocean. Of course, when they would go out on these trips, on these excursions out to sea, they would have to take barrels of fresh drinking water with them because you cannot drink the water of the ocean, salt water. So they would take barrels of fresh drinking water with them. However, those barrels, the quantity of how many they could store onto their ship was obviously limited. But maybe they wanted to go on a longer excursion, a long trip out to sea. That number of barrels that they could fit onto their ship wouldn't be enough. So they came and asked the Prophet ﷺ, What about, is it okay, O Messenger of Allah, that when we go out on our ships and we take the fresh drinking water, Could we save the barrels of fresh drinking water just for drinking? And as for wudu and ghusl, could we get water from the sea and use that for wudu and ghusl? Because the alternative was to use the fresh barrels of drinking water for drinking, for wudu, for ghusl, and they would run out very quickly. They wouldn't be able to last for the length of their excursion for their trip out to sea. So they said, O Messenger of Allah, could we save the fresh barrels of drinking water just to drink? And can we use the sea water, gather that up and use that for wudu and ghusl, which would save a lot of water in the barrels to carry on drinking and that would last a lot longer. So is it allowed for us to get the seawater out when we're on the trip to scoop out seawater and use that for ghusl and wudu. The Prophet ﷺ replied to them, It's water, i.e. the water of the sea and the ocean is pure and purifying. Meaning yes, seawater and ocean water can be used for purification. It can be used for wudu. It can be used for ghusl. So he told them, sea water, ocean water, it is pure, purifying, meaning it can be used for wudu and for ghusl. يعني توضأوا به لأنه طهور, meaning he was telling them, make wudu with it. It's pure. It is purifying. Use it. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam added on another section to the narration. And that was that he told them al-hillu maytatu that the animals of the sea that die within the sea then they are permissible to eat. But did the companions actually ask about that? Did the sailors ask about the fish and whether they're allowed to eat those fish and different types of fish in the sea? They didn't even ask about that. So why did the Prophet ﷺ add that piece of information on? The scholars, they say, this is from the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ that he added on an extra piece of information that he knew was completely relevant to their situation, even if they didn't ask about it. They didn't ask about it, but it was a completely relevant piece of information of benefit to them to know. That when you're out there, you can catch fish and you can take them out even if they're dead, Before you get a chance to slaughter them, you get them out in your nets, etc. You get to them, they're already dead. Normally, an animal, if it's already dead and you haven't slaughtered it, it's 
haram you can't eat it but the prophet sallallahu clarified to them for the fish dwelling animals or the the water the sea animals then it is permissible even if you have not slaughtered them so if you catch a fish or some other uh, uh, type of fish or animal that lives exclusively in the sea then it's not a requirement you have to slaughter it so any fish you catch you don't have to slaughter them you can just eat them so the Prophet ﷺ gave them that extra piece of information. And that is, as they say, min jawami'il kalim. It is from the miracle of the Prophet ﷺ that he used to mention a few short words and give many meanings in them. So now he told them very briefly, huwa tahuru ma uhu al hillu maytatu. Few words. And it's highlighted to them a great number of meanings that they can now use the seawater for wudu. They can use it for ghusl, meaning they can save their fresh water for just drinking. They can also eat the animals of the sea. They can eat them without having to slaughter them. Even if they find them as corpses, all of this information given to them that will be of great use to them when they go out onto the sea. There is a question here though that a Sheikh Al Fawzan highlights. He said, Why did they come and ask the Prophet وسلم, whether they can use the seawater for wudu and ghusl in the first place? The water of the sea, is it water or not? It's water. For purification, you have to use pure water. Is it water or not? It is water. So why did they come asking the question in the first place? Because the scholars they mentioned, this is from the precision of the companions. They knew that there's a difference between seawater and fresh water. A big difference, seawater is salty. Whereas fresh water is not. Therefore they wanted to make sure that the ruling for seawater is still the same as the ruling for fresh water. Just in case. This was the level of precision they had. Even though it's all clearly water. Fresh water, seawater, it's all water. But to be absolutely precise in their worship, they came to find out for definite that there's no differences there. That salt water, this is fresh water. Is it still the same ruling? Can we use it for ghusl, for wudu? They wanted to make sure and be precise that the difference of the salt to the fresh didn't make a difference in the ruling. And the Prophet ﷺ highlighted to them it doesn't make a difference. That is pure. It is pure. And it can be used for wudu and it can be used for ghusl. A Shaykh Al Fawzan says there are great wisdoms in Allah having made the waters in this way. Fallahu ja'ala fi al bahri maluha shadida li maslahat al kawn. Allah made the sea water extremely salty and that is for the benefit of creation it is something which brings about pleasant air and weather and you notice that when you go near the sea and the coolness of the breeze that you have near the sea near the shore it brings about goodness and coolness in the weather and also that salt water it is naturally purifying that certain types of germs or harmful things can be destroyed in that naturally because of the way it is its content of being salt water another thing is that 
salt water preserves the meat. So if a fish dies in the salt water, then it's still maintained. If you catch that dead fish afterwards, the meat will still be good because of the salt water content. Whereas in fresh water, it would begin to rot and go off much quicker and different. So the salt water preserves the meat of the fish too. So there are lots of reasons and wisdoms behind the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the creation. The topic regarding the animals of the sea, then the ruling normally we said is that a dead animal that has not been slaughtered is haram. But the animals of, because حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةِ It's mentioned in the Quran, the corpses, the dead animals that haven't been slaughtered are haram. But the seawater ones are permissible. And that means any type of fish that lives exclusively in the sea. Meaning if a bird flying above died and fell into the sea and then you caught its body afterwards, you cannot eat that. You cannot say, but that is from the dead of the sea. It means from the dead of the sea, i.e., Animals, fish that live exclusively in the sea to begin with. Not a bird that has died and fallen in or some other animal that has died and fallen into the sea. You can't pull that out and say, we can have this. We don't need to slaughter it because it's an animal of the sea. No. The meaning of the narration is the fish, the animals that live in the sea itself. Those, if you catch them and they are already dead, it is permissible to eat them. There are some scholars who have mentioned that certain types of animals, they would be exempt uh, from that. Uh, And some of these animals, they may be exempt because they are not exclusively seawater animals anyway. So for example, frogs and toads and those types of animals that go into water, they may even go into the sea. Then they are not considered permissible, many of the scholars say. Also, snakes, certain types of snakes mostly live underwater. But those snakes would not be permissible to eat. So there are certain types of animals that the scholars have mentioned are not befitting to eat. But generally otherwise, the general rule of thumb is any type of fish, it is permissible. Some scholars, they say, if a fish has a land equivalent, then you can't eat it. There are some scholars who had this opinion. If there's a certain type of fish that has a land equivalent, then you can't. Obvious things like a sea horse known as a sea horse because of its appearance and resemblance to a actual horse so now some scholars said that sea horse fish has a land equivalent resemblant therefore you can't have that but the correct opinion is you can there is no ruling about land equivalence or not any sea animal exclusively lives in the sea and dies within it, then it is permissible to eat that even if you have not slaughtered that animal. So this is the opening hadith, the very basic rulings that we can take from this hadith. Number one, returning back to the people of knowledge. Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know, those sailors, the minute they had a little doubt, sea water salty, fresh water fresh, can we make wudu with it or not? Straight away they return back to the Prophet ﷺ to find out. Second point we benefit from this is that sea water and salt water, despite being salty, sea water, ocean water, despite being salty, is permissible to use, it is pure. 
purifies you, you can make wudu with it, and you can make ghusl with it. Similarly, we also learn from this narration the permissibility of eating the animals of the sea that live exclusively in the sea even without having to slaughter, even if they are found dead. And fourthly, that the one who is being asked a question answers that question but can add additional information if he recognizes that the questioner would benefit from that additional information. Because sometimes the questioner himself may not know that he needs to ask about this or that too. He asks about a certain thing, you clarify that, but then you clarify some other things that are linked to it that may not have even occurred to him. So now you've clarified the whole issue to him and that is beneficial. So to add something extra as the Prophet Sallallahu did in this case, then that is permissible and good and from the prophetic methods also. So that is the opening narration. That's where we'll conclude today. Insha'Allah ta'ala, next week we'll carry on at midday, 12 o'clock on the British summer time. 12 o'clock next week, Saturday, insha'Allah with the next section, lesson number two. Anybody, if you have questions here, obviously no problem. We can ask directly. Sisters can send them forward. But anybody online who has questions, then you can send them forward on the websites uh, or on the Twitter account. All of it under the name of Tawheed Rochdale. T-A-W-H-E-E-D-R-O-C-H-D-A-L-E. Tawheed Rochdale. So you can find that, uh, the Twitter account, for example, you can send the questions there, maybe the website, tawheedrochdale.com. So there are different means you can communicate your questions. And inshallah, we can have a look at those this week. And then next week, we can answer those that come in as well. Insha'Allah ta'ala. So we'll conclude upon that for today. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.